Welcome to the AWS Architecture series. These are just quick certification notes that I went through when I was trying to do my AWS professional and DevOps engineer professional exams. So I made a lot of notes and these are just some of the summarized version of it. Let's look at some, some of the important things that you should remember. When it comes to IAM, when you hear an IAM user, always remember it's a person or an application that uses a credential to make requests. When you hear about IAM role, remember it is a resource, an IAM entity that defines a set of permissions for making IAM service requests, basically AWS service requests. When you hear about a group, IAM group, remember IAM group is always IAM users, a group of IAM users. Let's move on to the reserved IPs. You might already know about it, but there are five IPs that are reserved in AWS VPC. Any VPC that you create, there are five IP addresses that are reserved. And if you look at these five IP addresses, first one is the network address. This is the first address in the address space that you have allocated for your VPC. So in our example, suppose it is 10.0.0.0, .0 .0 .0, then the network address zero. Um, this IP is reserved for the network address. You can't use that. The one over here in the address space that you have chosen is the second address in the address space. It is reserved for AWS for the VPC router. The third one, which is used by the DNS, so reserved by AWS for the DNS. The IP of DNS server is based on the VPC network range plus two. So suppose your range starts from zero, it is zero plus two. If it starts from 10, it is 10 plus two. The third address space, which is zero, one, two, and three. Now the fourth one in this series from zero when you're starting from zero is reserved for a future use. AWS is not using it right now, but it is reserved for a future usage, which might come. The last one of data space, in this case, it is 255. It's basically a network broadcast address. And VPC don't support broadcast as of now, but AWS reserves this for maybe a future broadcast need. Network, let's talk about network. How many internet gateways you can have per VPC? You can only have one internet gateway per VPC. How many VGW or virtual private gateway you can have per VPC? You can only have one VGW per VPC. There are two types of routing, static and dynamic. AWS supports BGP as dynamic routing protocol. Static routing is where you define each and every IP address saying route from this IP to this IP. In dynamic routing, you don't hard code the IP addresses. Basically, the information is shared, the routes are shared, and then the route is automatically learned by traversing through the network. The BGP stands for Border Gateway Protocol. Next one is Transit Gateway. AWS Transit Gateway is a managed resource, so you don't have to worry about the scaling of Transit Gateway. Transit Gateway is a regional resource, so it is a region specific. If you are running multi-region, then you will need two Transit Gateways. Transit Gateway can have peering connections across regions. So one transit gateway can peer with another transit gateway. Now what exactly transit gateway brings to the table is rather than having one-to-one -one VPC peering connections, you can put a transit gateway which can allow you to not only do the transitive routing, like in VPC peering, you can't do uh, a transitive routing in a way that three networks, A, B, and C, they are there and they all are connected to each other. So A is connected to B and B is connected to C. A cannot go to C because it doesn't allow you a transitive routing. 
if you have a transit gateway, transit gateway connects VPCs in on-premise network through a central hub. So it's kind of a hub and spoke network. This simplifies your network, plus puts an end to complex peering relationship. Otherwise, if you go with VPC peering, and if you have five or six networks to connect, five or six different VPCs to connect, then it will be a full mesh network, which is going to be very complex routing everywhere. Moving on to the next. Transit Gateway can be shared across AWS accounts. All attachments in a region can be done by a Transit Gateway. Now, looking at some drawbacks, we know site-to-site -site VPN in some scenarios are required. But what are the drawbacks? Firstly, site-to-site -site VPN uses internet, public internet, and it is dependent on internet. The bandwidth is 1.2 GB bandwidth limit. It is unpredictable because it is not dependent on a stable connection. So the connectivity depends upon your provider. Bandwidth is not guaranteed. Your provider may not guarantee you a consistent bandwidth. Let's talk about Direct Connect. Firstly, the drawback of Direct Connect is it is not encrypted. So you need to have a site-to-site -site VPN on top of it to enable encryption. This will remove this limitation. Direct Connect needs dynamic routing, border gateway protocol in this case. Uh, by the way, Direct Connect is basically you are connecting to a AWS provider in your area. So you have a direct connection from your location to the AWS provider in your area. And the AWS provider is having a connection, direct connection to the AWS backbone network. So that's why Direct Connect is more stable it guarantees uh, better performance. Not only that, it takes more time to establish because you need to have a physical connection from your location to the uh, Direct Connect partner location, which is already connected to the AWS network. So let's move on. It is a dedicated connection. It is good for large data sets. So suppose you have a lot of uh, network requirement, a data consistency requirement, a large bandwidth, and um, your dedicated connection should have good bandwidth and guaranteed bandwidth, then Direct, Direct Connect is uh, an option. Real-time data feed, it has low latency. It is consistent. Sometimes your organization wants to have a compliance in place where your data doesn't travel on the public internet. So that way you can send your data, which is going to be private and running on the AWS backbone network. And it can, it can fulfill your compliance requirement. Instead of using multiple VGW, you can use transit gateway. So in this case, um, if you want to have multiple VGWs um, connected with Direct Connect connections, you can. it's better to have Transit Gateway in place, which would be cost effective. Direct Connect has an integration with CloudWatch. Consider options for resiliency when working with Direct Connect. So we'll talk about resiliency in Direct Connect in the next slide. What are the connection types? First one is dedicated connections. Your company, basically, how do you build this connection? Your company uh, built by you, it is all set up done by you to a Direct Connect provider. 
and then you can choose from 1 GB or 10 GB ports that are available either 1 GB or 10 GB in a hosted connection basically a hosted connection is a connection that is done by the AWS partner or the DX provider direct internet provider it will give you options from 50 MB to 10 Gbps. Any, there are many options available in this particular range rather than the 1 GB and 10 GB um, ports that are available in dedicated connection. The drawbacks are each connection is a single VIF. If more VIFs are required, then you need to buy more connection. You can create a direct connect public WIF to connect to AWS public endpoints with public IP addresses. And you can also have private WIFs that are enabled to access private AWS services such as um, your VPC, EC2 instances, and you can have a transit WIFs also attached to the transit gateway. What are the benefits you can buy between 50 MB and 10 Gbps? Some providers provide resiliency option, so you don't have to build for resiliency. Direct Connect provider help in establishing the Direct Connect connection. So they will help you troubleshoot and set up your Direct Connect connection. Otherwise, they'll have to do that on your own. Let's talk about virtual interfaces. There are public virtual interfaces, which are used to connect to services that are uh, available through public IPs, such as S3, public endpoints. And there are private virtual interfaces that are used to connect to private interfaces. Um, private WIFs are used to connect resources by private IPs, such as EC2 instances, load balancer, private IP address, or endpoint. Then you have transit virtual interface. A transit virtual interface should be used to access one or more Amazon VPC transit gateways associated with Direct Connect gateways. Only one private WIF is allowed per VPC and VLAN ID is used by Direct Connect Gateway to identify traffic per VPC. Continuing on Direct Connect, Direct Connect resiliency options. The first one is classic or dev test model. In order to have this model, you should have true cross connect connection in Direct Connect location, and then two components in HQ in one Direct connect location so you have one direct connect location and then two components in HQ which is your on-prem and then two two cross connect connection in your direct connect location high resiliency you should say one cross connect component in each location then two components in HQ and then two direct connect locations and max resiliency has two cross connect component in each location, two component in HQ, and two direct connect locations. So this is basically, if one of the direct connect location is down, at least you'll have another one to serve all these requests that you have from your on-prem to the cloud or cloud to the on-prem. Let's talk about direct connect gateway. To connect to a private wave from different region, you need a direct connect gateway. To connect private wave in the same region, you need a direct connect connection. A transit gateway in direct connect connection, uh, a connection between them needs a direct connect gateway. This is the end of the show. Thank you for watching. If you like the content, Please like, subscribe, and press the bell icon for future updates. This is your host, Bhavesh Kumar, signing off. Thank you.